Five. Five. Curry hits a three. Four. Four. Three. Three. It's a hit by Watt. Set number ten. Two. Missy. Missy with a record-breaking goal. One. One. Welcome to BSS Sports. Now, here are your hosts, Steve and Trevor. And Trevor. Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of BSS Sports. My name is Stephen Chill with the ever lovely Trevor Struthers. The NBA deadline is passed. We're not going to talk about all the deals, but this was a very eventful deadline. One of the biggest trades, in my opinion, was the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Chicago Bulls. For some reason, the Chicago Bulls thought it would be a great idea to give up Taj Gibson Doug McDermott, a 2018 second-round pick, so virtually nothing, but it's still there, uh, for Cameron Payne, Joffrey Lovern, and Anthony Morrow. And for the casual NBA fan, they wouldn't know who any of those guys is, but the big player in this trade, if you've read any of the articles, is Cameron Payne, who, if you look at him statistically, is not good. He is projected to be a very good player, However, with that being said, so far not a lot has come from him. He was the number 14th draft in last year, or the 2015 NBA draft. But I'm shocked the Bulls did this. Oklahoma City, great trade. I mean, you, you got Russell Westbrook. He's doing great. Another triple double, or four, triple double with 40 points, whatever it is. That's the seventh all time. The Thunder are looking really good, but the Bulls, I'm confused what they're trying to do here. I think it's because, I mean, right now they're projected to be a bottom seed, and I don't think they're satisfied with that. Uh, but, I mean, obviously, yeah, the guys they picked up, there are some question marks. There, there oh, usually always is. I mean, obviously they're not they're not top caliber guys, but, I mean, you're, you're not going to get those guys back for, for who they dealt out. Then now they dealt out a few guys, right? So, I mean, that numbers game. But, I mean, these guys are going to come in, probably get some, some opportunities to play. And, I mean, yeah, it is a bit of a head-scratcher just because um, Chicago, I mean, although they will be a bottom seed, especially if they end up matching up with the Raptors, uh, that's uh, a favorable potentially for the Bulls to pull that one out. And so they could be that upset, you know, bottom seed candidate coming out of the East in the playoffs. And so, I mean, I don't know if they can now, but uh, to make a trade like this, it it can be a little head-scratching. I think for the Bulls, when Tom Thibodeau was in charge, uh, the one playoff run they had when they barely had any players and everybody played way too many minutes, they got tired, and then they fired Tom Thibodeau and things just went straight downhill. But for the Raptors, things have been looking up ever since that uh, Bulls-Tom Thibodeau thing a few years ago. They made a move at the deadline, giving up Jared Sollinger, who was plagued with injuries, two second-round picks, which is a whole lot of nothing in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And in return, they got P.J. Tucker. And the big talks about getting P.J. Tucker, someone to guard LeBron. But with that being said, he's playing on the second unit, so I don't know why people are saying, oh, yeah, we got him to guard LeBron when he's playing on the second unit. Yes, I know he's just getting introduced for the Raptors, but do you like the trade? I do, because in a way, I mean, he's, he's a defensive specialist, and, and that's where that, that's going to come into when it comes to going up against a team like the, Ca- the Cavs where we have to try to shut down a LeBron James. Is, I mean, that's obviously his focus, and... Um, you know he's a big guy as well. So, but I mean, yeah, I think they're trying to trying to work him in. Um, he doesn't give you much offensively, which can also contribute to that. Like he might he like when he's on the floor, you're looking at him strictly for defense. So you're you're not expecting much out of him offensively, and that probably has a lot to do with uh, the fact that he's on that uh, second unit is because uh, he's, he's he doesn't really have a, a two way game. It's mainly just focusing on defense, trying to get the job done there. Okay, so we're going to trust the process in Philadelphia. The 76ers making a pretty big move. They uh, decided to give up Nerlens Noel, uh, and they got Justin Anderson, Andrew Bogut, and a protected first-round pick. Uh, the big thing with the Nerlens Noel trade was it was kind of like the Detroit Pistons la- uh, the other, uh, two years ago with Greg Monroe, uh, Andre Drummond, and uh, Josh Smith. They had way too many bigs. Uh, Philadelphia had Nerlens Noel, uh, Joel Embiid, and Jalil Okafor. Still don't understand why they drafted a big in that uh, pick that they did last year. 
With that being said, the trade doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for the 76ers. They get Justin Anderson, still two years left on his rookie contract. The guy's averaging like less than five points a game, not really an impact player at all. Andrew Bogut, they were simply acquiring him to trade elsewhere, and that didn't happen, so they're looking at buying him out. And they get a first-round pick, but if it's not used, then it turns into two second-round picks, which is not good for the 76ers. I get that they needed to move somebody, but do you think that the uh, Dallas Mavericks were the ones they should have been dealing with? I mean, it, it, it could have been Dallas. Um, just for the sake of the 76ers, I mean, there was uh, some some possible rumors about Okafor being the one that, that, that very well could have been moved. And, I mean, that probably gets you a bigger return. Um, the interesting thing that comes with this is obviously do you want the bigger return with trade or do you want to hold on to your key guys and kind of trade the the one that, uh, you know, you go down the depth chart to the guy that's uh, closer to the bottom that can still get you something, and that's what they did. And uh, it's not a good return at all, but uh, <laughs> when you're the 76ers, I th- they, they're, they sort of have their base and they're just trying to figure out who to fill in where. They're still not very good, but, I mean, that's going to come around with uh, with time eventually, you would hope. But uh, if not, uh, 76ers, a lot of work to do. So the Raptors, we mentioned they got P.J. Tucker, but the big one, Serge Ibaka <laughs> coming to Toronto. Uh, Toronto's on a three-game winning streak right now, and the two games that Serge has been with them, uh, they were down in the first half, and they came back and won. And I have to admit, it was kind of like the Super Bowl, both games. I watched the first half and was like, okay, this doesn't look good. They come back and win, so I need to stop leaving games when they're, you know, sports. Anything can happen. Uh, But with that being said, Serge Ibaka comes to Toronto. We give up Terrence Ross and either the Raptors' first pick or the Los Angeles Clippers' first round pick, whatever one's worse. Uh, I like to trade for the Raptors. I mean, Terrence Ross, sure, he's got flair, but it's Serge Ibaka. And Terrence Ross had a pretty good game uh, just a couple days ago with that, with the Magic. But what Ross needed was a change of scenery. You're obviously not going to get that if you stay in Toronto. Uh, And, I mean, hey, I mean, credit to the Raptors with these moves that they made. I mean, I mentioned with P.J. Tucker and now as well with Serge Ibaka, they're shoring up their defense, which is something they really needed to do. So uh, you have to give them credit for that. And Serge is also a guy, obviously, that can contribute um, more than P.J. Tucker can offensively because Serge is obviously a guy that can throw up a three ball as well. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, trying to shore up that defense because offensively they still find ways to get to get it done, and Serge Ibaka is not going to hurt when it comes to their offensive production. Okay, so the biggest trade of the deadline. I, I Personally, I think it was the Bulls one because it's just the value I, I don't think was there. But, but the bigger one that the world is talking about and questioning the sanity of the Sacramento Kings, DeMarcus Cousins – Joins up with Anthony Davis. Who saw that coming? Did did you see this coming? I don't want. I don't think anybody did really. Um. Yeah, the return was ugly for the Kings. We know that. Buddy High to Tyreek Evans, first round pick for this year, and a 2017 second round pick again. But, a whole but whenever lot you of tra- whenever you trade a star, and, and I mean especially with, with a, a big as well, um, because they're they're so unique to have like a star, you know, like. Big that I mean he's probably the, the the best center in the game right so you trade him and um, nobody's gonna like the return regardless um, but this gives uh, New Orleans um, who thought New Orleans was really gonna be like anything and now they have maybe the best front court in the NBA so uh, that's something to watch I guess as, as time rolls on but uh, with Anthony Davis I mean that, that that trade happened the same day Anthony Davis put up fifty four in the All Star game too so I mean how about that but. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, I mean, it's the All-Star game, but still 54. I mean, I mentioned it last week, 54 points in the All-Star game. You know, Anthony Davis, uh, who saw that coming as well. Um, both guys are impressive. And, I mean, usually you try to build your backcourt and go from there. But uh, it looks like the Pelicans have it set from the front, and they have to try to work out what they want to do in the back and, and see what they can do. It's a tough Western Conference. So who knows if this really works out at all for uh, for the Pelicans. Well, so far with DeMarcus Cousins in the lineup, they've lost to the Rockets. They've lost to the Mavericks, who are one of the worst teams in the NBA. And the Pelicans were at home, and they've lost to the Oklahoma City Thunder. Again, they made the great tra- trade with Chicago. Well, so that, maybe that, that comes help. back to the question. It's like, I mean, what would you rather do, build your front court or build your back court? The back court is who's going to have the ball the majority of the time in big, spot, uh, big situations. and. 
they, they just don't have much there, and, and it's leading to losses. And it's something that they no doubt have to try to build around. Um, otherwise, they're going to waste what just happened with this trade, and they're going to waste away Anthony Davis. It, it was a weird trade to start with, kind of, because when you look at it, Anthony Davis is one of the superstars in the NBA. Yeah. He can do it all. Why get somebody who not necessarily does the exact same as Anthony Davis, but plays in the same region as Anthony Davis, that's always going to want the ball. He He's kind of cocky to say. Like, I mean, it's DeMarcus <laughs> Cousins, right? So he's going to want the ball, and that's expected of him. But from the Pelicans' point of view, I simply don't understand the point in this one. Because, I mean, both of them are going to end up losing points. It's kind of hard to have the double big way of doing things, for lack of a better term. I mean, when you look at teams, it's the Chris Paul, it's Blake Griffin. Okay, so you have a guard and you have a big. They're working together, kind of like Kyle Lowry and Jonas Valanciunas when they're clicking. And you, you could go on throughout the league, but there's very little dynamic duos for bigs. I mean... When you're looking at it, you have Omir Osik and Dwight Howard a few years ago, and that was pretty decent because both of them had their kind of, you know, differences. One came off the bench, one started, and it made a difference. But both these guys, they're starters, they're superstars. You're completely changing the fundamentals of your team with this trade, and so far, they're 0-3 with it. Sure, DeMarcus Cousins looks great, you're going to sell jerseys, but I just don't feel that there was a point in the Pelicans making this trade except to say, hey, we're Sacramento, pay attention to us. I mean, absolutely, but just from the simple fact that, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a blockbuster, and, and it draws some attention towards New Orleans, and, I mean, they just finished hosting the All-Star game. Though I mean, the funny thing was when apparently <laughs> DeMarcus was told about the trade, obviously, after the— uh, I mean, during his media thing after the game, and he's like, oh, I love New Orleans. Um, (laughs) That that was pretty cool if that was maybe the moment he found out and he played that off well. But, uh, yeah, it's a blockbuster for the sake of a blockbuster potentially. And, I mean, hey, they got a big-name superstar, probably going to sell some more tickets. But it's a good point about, like, now, you know, in a way this is going to affect both of them. I mean, hey, maybe the 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 Pelicans just wanted to raise the amount of uh, technical fouls that uh, their team has this year. Who knows? Now, it wasn't just the NBA that, that had a couple of uh, trades going on. We, we heard – I mean, I don't like social media as much as I used to because everybody's having an opinion, mm-hmm. and the Ben Bishop trade happened. Ben Bishop got traded from Tampa Bay. Now, that's not shocking, which a lot of people are saying. I am one of them. More for the fact that he went to the Kings. Not because Tampa Bay got rid of him, but they went, or he went, to the Kings. Are the Kings really in need of a goalie the caliber of Ben Bishop? They were like a month or two ago. Not necessarily now. Jonathan Quick just came back and had a pretty good performance at his return. It was like one goal on like 33, 34 shots. So um, a bit of a head scratcher there too. Um, but obviously we know what Ben Bishop can bring. Their goaltending is set for the rest of the season now. They don't have to worry about that. Well, for um, sure. So uh, the Kings gave up Peter Budai, which is their backup goalie, Eric Saranac, which is a defenseman who plays with Erie, which uh, Tampa Bay drafted Taylor Radish, so obviously there's a bit of cohesion there, and that's why they wanted to look at him. Uh, And they also gave up a seventh-round pick for this year and a conditional draft pick for this year. And then all Tampa Bay gave up, well, I mean, not all, but Ben Bishop and a fifth-round draft pick for this year. Who do you think won this trade? I mean, I know they already have a goaltender, but I think the Kings. Just because I don't see anything of real substance coming back for a team starting goaltender. And usually you think there there would be. Trading, tra- yeah, trading starting goaltending is hard because, I mean, like, what is the equal piece to, like, a starting goaltender that's not, like, a star, a star player? And you're probably not going to get a start back for a number one goaltender. You're going to get something less than that. But you've got to watch that it's not too less. I mean, you can trade starter for starter. We saw, we've uh, seen stuff like that happen before. But um, something like this, it's like... Yeah, I mean, this is a guy that has really been uh, important for you guys, let alone, you know, in the regular season, but also in the playoffs where you guys have actually gone deep, and Ben Bishop's been impressive, and he's a big guy, so he has that going for him as well, where he's, he has the size, you know, tallest goaltender in NHL history, um, and he's also able to, like, it doesn't affect his game in a negative way, it only seems to affect his game really in a, in a positive way for the most part, which 
is is great. And now they have these two goaltenders, and I don't know how long they're both under contract, but now they have two goaltenders, and now that's something that, uh, I mean, hey, they're going to have good, good goaltending every night, assuming they both stay healthy, are the Kings now. And, I mean, for the Tampa Bay Lightning, I guess this is really a, a show of uh, confidence in Andre Vasilevsky, a guy that, uh, if you'd watched the World Juniors like just a few years ago, a guy that you saw, saw in the Russian net, it felt like, for about three consecutive years. So he, he's a very good goaltending prospect that uh, has been hidden behind Ben Bishop for the last couple of years and now he really gets a chance here to uh to show off his stuff and and be the guy that Tampa can rely on and obviously this comes because Tampa's had the had a disappointing season um they wanted to try to um rebuild I guess a little bit or retool because they still have some pieces a lot of good pieces they just need to figure it out I don't know if trading the starting goaltender is the way to go usually when you're a bad team you want the starting goaltender to be pretty good and uh try to help you out from that perspective get you as many many points as you can try to make you respectable that kind of thing and now they've traded that starting goaltender and a team that could be good next year I mean who knows because I don't think anybody expected this out of Tampa Bay uh to trade their starting goaltender and now if what if Andre Vasilevsky can't live up to uh, the potential is the big question and uh, I mean Steve Eiserman has been commended for his ability to work as a GM but maybe he slipped a bit here I mean if you're Steven Stamkos you wish that you actually came to Toronto that's it for this edition of BSS Sports make sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook archiving all of our works on YouTube at BSS Productions and if you like the NBA trade deadline Wednesday at 3 p.m. the NHL trade deadline commences We'll talk about it next week. Make sure to keep following our Twitter pages as we'll try to keep you up to date with all of the trades. Thanks for listening, and enjoy your day. You're listening. To-